الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا فيا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما قال تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تتولوا قوما غضب الله عليهم صدق الله العلي العظيم عطروا أفواهكم وزينوا مجالسكم بذكر الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Is the story of the attack, is the story of the oppression of Fatima to Zahra a merely historical discussion? Meaning, is what transpired between Abu Bakr and Fatima to Zahra simply a historical issue? an argument about a piece of land that took place 14 centuries ago that we should just forget and say this was something in the past and it has no relevance to us and our relationship with Allah? Or does that encounter between Abu Bakr and Lady Fatima, does it have theological implications? Because there are many Muslims in the world today in the name of Islamic unity, they would argue that why are we arguing about a disagreement between Abu Bakr and Fatima to Zahra, something that took place 14 centuries ago. There was a disagreement about a piece of land and it was sorted out. And if mistakes were made, Allah is forgiving and we shouldn't pass any judgment. Now, tonight in the limited time that I have, I want to demonstrate that the confrontation between Abu Bakr and Fatima al-Zahra salam has serious theological implications that are relevant for us today. Now, to understand how this confrontation developed, we have to speak a little bit about what happened during the lifetime of the Prophet. Meaning that this confrontation between Fatima to Zahra and Abu Bakr, the seeds of this confrontation happened during the time of the Prophet. And it's related to the land of Fadak. And in order to understand the nuances and the details of this confrontation, of this disagreement, we have to understand how, what Fedek is, what is the background story, in order to appreciate what exactly happened after the death of the Prophet. Now, as many of us know, in the seventh year after the Hijrah, the Prophet and Ali ibn Abi Talib and the Muslims, they conquered the fortress of Khaybar. And the fortress of Khaybar 
was essentially conquered by none other than the commander of the faithful, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. And Khaybar was the most important fortress. It was the most important Jewish settlement in Medina. Now, when Khaybar fell, when it was conquered by the Muslims, news spread that Muhammad and his companions, they have captured Khaybar. And this frightened the Jews in the surrounding areas because they thought to themselves that if the Prophet was able to take over Khaybar, then we're next. They heard that Amir al-Mu'mineen killed their most famous warrior. So they received news that Khaybar had been conquered. So they were anticipating that they were next. So Fedak is a settlement that is near Khaybar. It's a village that is near Khaybar. And it was controlled by these Jews. So the Jews of Khaybar, of uh, Fedak, they basically surrendered the orchards of Fedak to the Prophet as a truce, meaning that do not attack us for conspiring against you. Simply take the land of Fedak as a settlement, as a truce. Now, one important thing to keep in mind is that Khaybar was conquered through battle. And in Islamic law, whatever is conquered by the Muslim forces, the spoils of war are divided amongst the fighters. One fifth belongs to the Prophet, and four fifths is distributed among those who fought. However, Fedek was not captured through military conflict. Fedek was surrendered without any battle. It was surrendered to the Prophet without any fighting. And anything that is surrendered to the Prophet without any military activity, without fighting, becomes the sole property of the Prophet. Now, what's important to keep in mind is, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually speaks about this in the Quran. In Surah 59, ayah number 6, Allah speaks about those territories that are captured without any fighting. Allah says they belong to the Prophet. Allah says, وَمَا أَفَاءَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ رَسُولِهِ مِنْهُمْ فَمَا أَوْجَفْتُمْ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ خَيْلٍ وَلَا رِكَابٍ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يُسَلِّطُ رُسُلَهُ عَلَىٰ مَنْ يَشَاءٍ Allah says, as for what Allah has given in spoils from them, from the Jews of Fadak, to the Messenger, you spurred neither horse nor camel for it. Meaning, Allah is saying that, since the Muslims did not fight to capture Fadak, it was surrendered without fighting, it belongs to the Prophet. It is the sole property of the Prophet. And then Allah explains why He does this. Allah says, because I want to give authority to my messengers above the people. And one way that Allah gives authority is that Allah gives financial strength to His prophets, to the messengers. So now, so Khaybar is conquered by the Muslims and the spoils are distributed because there was a, there was a battle. Fedek is not divided amongst them. It belongs solely to the Prophet. So the Prophet does with it whatever he wishes. So now Fedek is in the possession of the Prophet. And this is where you see that Surah 17, verse number 26 is revealed. And by the way, Fedek, we have riwayat from the Ahlul Bayt that speak about the revenue that Fedek used to generate. You know, we're not talking about an orchard that used to just yield a few fruits and it was just... 
We have narrations that say that the annual revenue of Fedak was 25,000 dinars, 25,000 gold coins. And other narrations say that it generates 250,000 dinars. And the reason why we have this difference in numbers is because it was in the possession of Lady Fatima for four years. And it could be that in the first year it generated a little bit, and then after it was developed, it started to generate more. You know, to give you a sense of how much revenue Fedak generated, suffice to mention that after Fatima to Zahra delivered her Fedak sermon, Abu Bakr was about to sign over the papers and basically return it to Lady Fatima. And this is where Umar ibn al-Khattab, what does he say? How are we going to fund the army? Which means what? The amount of revenue that Fedak was generating is enough to fund a military budget. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when the Prophet is given Fedak, Allah reveals to the Prophet, Surah 17, Ayah 26, وَآتِ ذَا الْقُرْبَ And give the right to your nearest of kin. Now, of course, the Prophet has many relatives. The, the ayah doesn't specify what is the haq, what is the right that should be given. And it doesn't specify who is the recipient, who is meant by the qurba. If you go to <coughs> the tafasir of the Qur'an, for example, Jalaluddin as Suyuti, a Sunni mufassir of the Qur'an, and this is something that I actually checked last night, just to be sure. He mentions a couple of narrations. One narration is from Ibn Abbas, the companion of the Prophet, and the other is Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. And they say, and this is with their statement verbatim, لَمَّا نَزَلَتْ هَذِهِ الْآيَةِ When this ayah was revealed to the Prophet, Da'a Rasulullah Fatima. The Prophet called upon Fatima. Fa'ataha Fadak. And the Prophet gave Fadak to Fatima. And it was Jibra'il who explained the meaning of this verse to the Prophet, saying that the Qurba is Fatima and the Haq is Fadak. Now why? Why is the Prophet giving Fadak to Fatima There are two reasons that we can mention. Number one, this is the way, this is the Prophet's way of paying back Khadija for all the money she spent to propagate Islam. The Prophet felt indebted to Sayyidah Khadija. She spent every dime that she had to protect to preserve the message, to keep the Muslims alive when the Bani Hashim were boycotted. And now he has this wealth. And the only, the only surviving descendant of, Fatim, of, of Khadija is who? Fatima. And this shows you that, yes, many Muslims who are converting to Islam, they don't realize that the only reason why they have the privilege of knowing the truth is because of the sacrifices of Khadija. So many Muslims may have forgotten about the contributions of Khadija, but Allah did not forget. Allah wants it to be known that this woman is to be honored. So, Fedek is not, in reality, it's not the inheritance of Fatima a.s. It was actually owned by her during the life of the Prophet. It's not that Fedak was owned by Rasulullah and then he wrote a wasiyah and he said, after I die, transfer ownership of Fedak to Fatima. There's a very beautiful narration where <clears throat> Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullahi alayhi Allahumma salli ala Muhammad you know, before I mention the narration, it's worth mentioning here that when Fatima to Zahra took control of Fedak, she owned it for four years. After the death of the Prophet, we know that Saqifah took place. 
Abu Bakr was secretly appointed as the Khalifa of the Muslims while Amir al muminin is preparing his funeral. Imagine, the Prophet is not yet buried and the Muslims are, some of the Muslims are secretly electing their own leader. In any case, that's the first thing that happens. The Khilafah is usurped. I mean, I want you to think about the change, how drastically things are changing in a span of 48 hours. The Prophet dies, Saqifah happens, Abu Bakr is appointed. On the second day, two days after Saqifah, Fadak is confiscated. Meaning, literally, they tell the people to leave the land of Fadak. It is now seized by the de facto government, the new government. Now, what is the argument that is being made? The argument that Abu Bakr makes is, I heard the Prophet say, نَحْنُ مَعَاشِرَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ لَا نُوَرِّثِ So there are two problems here. Here Abu Bakr is saying that, I heard, and he's the only one who reports this narration. I heard the Prophet say that, we, the Prophets, do not leave inheritance. Whatever we leave is charity. Number one, Fadak is not inheritance. It was owned by Fatima during her life. But let's assume that it was inheritance. Don't you think that this law that you claim, that this hadith that you attribute to the Prophet, where the Prophet doesn't leave inheritance, whatever he leaves behind his life, don't you think he would have told Fatima? This is something that directly is related to her. Don't you think the Prophet ﷺ, being the wise teacher that he is, don't you think he would have told his daughter, by the way, after I die, there's no inheritance for you, because whatever I leave behind is sadaqah. Instead of leaving her in the dark, and having her go to Abu Bakr and say that Fadak belongs to me, and then she goes and gives a lengthy speech, and she ends up dying of grief over this confrontation? Are we to believe that? Are we to believe that Rasulullah told someone outside of it, a stranger that, by the way, this Islamic law is, is something unique to prophets, where prophets don't leave inheritance. And Ali doesn't know about it. And Umm Ayman doesn't know about it. And Fatima Tussar, everyone is oblivious of it. Except for Abu Bakr. And this is where we see that Abu Bakr demands witnesses. And there's a very interesting conversation between Amir al muminin and Abu Bakr. And this is mentioned by Shaykh al-Tabrasi in Kitab al-Ihtijaj and Ibn Abi al-Hadid al-Mu'tazili in Sharh Naj al -Balagha. Abu Bakr now has seized control of Fadak and now he's saying, Fatima alayhi salam, she sends someone, the narration's in Bukhari, she sends someone to tell him that this was you know, this is my inheritance from the Prophet. This belongs to me. Abu Bakr says, the Prophets do not leave inheritance. Where are your witnesses? So he's asking Fatima to Zahra to produce witnesses. And I'll read the narration for you because I think that it's very beautiful how Amir al muminin argues this. فَقَالَ أَبُو بَكْرِ So when Fatima to Zahra demands Fadak, Abu Bakr says, Hada fayul muslimin. Fadak is the property of all Muslims. So he's trying to treat Fadak like Khaybar. That just like Khaybar was distributed to the, the Muslims, Fadak is also public property. It belongs to all of the Muslims. فَإِنْ أَقَامَتْ شُهُودًا أَنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ جَعَلَهُ لَهَا وَإِلَّا فَلَا حَقَّ لَهَا فِي I'll change my opinion if she can produce witnesses that the Prophet gave it to her. So this is his argument. Amir al-Mu'mineen is there. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says to him, Ya Aba Bakr, atahkumu fina bi khilaf hukmillahi fil muslimin? The Imam says, Oh Abu Bakr, are you giving a judgment that contradicts Allah's judgment on these matters? Abu Bakr said, no. What I'm, the judgment that I'm giving is 
It corresponds to what the Sharia teaches. Then the Imam he says, فَإِن كَانَ فِي يَدِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ شَيْءٌ يَمْلِكُونَهُ ثُمَّ الدَّعَيْتُ أَنَا فِي مَنْ تَسْأَلُ الْبَيِّنَ Abu Bakr is asking Fatima to prove that she owns Fadak. Amir al muminin he says to Abu Bakr, if something is owned by the Muslims and it's in their possession and I come and I claim that it's mine, who do you ask for evidence? Meaning the Imam is trying to say that if something is under someone's control, as an example, if I'm sitting in my house and someone comes and knocks on the door and says, this is my house. If we go to court, the judge is going to ask who to provide evidence? The claimant. Because possession is nine tenths of the law. The assumption is if something is under your control, under your possession, you own it. If someone wants to challenge that, they have to provide evidence. So Amir al muminin he's saying to Abu Bakr, if something is owned by Muslims and I come and it's under their control and I come and I claim that it's mine, who are you going to ask for bayina? Who are you going to ask for witnesses? Abu Bakr says, Iyaka as'alul bayina. I'll ask you for evidence because it's in their possession and now you're claiming that it's yours. And then Amir al muminin he says, فَمَا بَالُ فَاطِمَةً سَأَلْتَهَا الْبَيِّنَ عَلَى مَا فِي يَدِهَا وَقَدْ مَلَكَتْهُ فِي حَيَاتِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ وَبَعْدِ Then why are you asking Fatima for witnesses that she owns Fadak? She owned it during the lifetime of the Prophet. You seized it. You dismissed, you fired the workers that were working on the land of Fadak. So it was in her possession. So you have to prove that it is Fayul Muslimin. Because Fadak was in her possession, and possession is nine tenths of the law, as we say. And if someone wants to argue that it, it doesn't belong to that person, they have to provide the evidence. The narration says, Fasakata Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr did not have an answer. And this is in Islamic uh, jurisprudence, in juris one of the jurisprudential maxims that we have is Qa'idatul Yad. And Amir al Mu'minin applies the maxim of the hand, the possession of the hand, to argue with Abu Bakr. And then Umar says, Ya Ali, da'na min kalamik. Oh Ali, leave this talking and this arguing. Fa'inna la naqwa ala hujjatik. We can't debate you or defeat you in debating. Fa'in athbatta bi shuhudin udul wa illa fahuwa fayun lil muslimin. If you have witnesses, bring them forth. If you don't, it is the property of the Muslims. Now, Abu Bakr's justification was what? I heard the Prophet say that Fadak is the property of all Muslims. That we, the Prophets, do not leave inheritance. What was Fatimah to Zahra's reaction to that? Was her reaction, thank you so much for telling me, I was unaware and alhamdulillah, I submit to the words of the Prophet. Fatima to Zahra rejected the claim that that is a hadith of the Prophet. If she was doubtful, she, could, she would have asked. She says, let me ask my husband, let me ask. She didn't say that. Fatima to Zahra, the fact that the narration in Bukhari says, when Abu Bakr refused to give Fadak back, even after she produces Amir al muminin as a witness. Hassan and Hussein, Umm Ayman, the foster mother of the Prophet, who the Prophet said is one of the women of paradise. Even Abu Bakr's own wife, Asma, she testified that Abu Bakr, that Fadak was given to Fatima during the life of the Prophet. But since Asma was previously married to Ja'far al-Tayyar, he rejected the testimony of his own wife and saying that you're just trying to testify for something that will benefit Bani Hashim. You're biased, basically. So when Abu Bakr denies 
Fadak. Despite the issue of Qa'idatul Yad, despite the fact that she's produced witnesses, the narration in Bukhari says, فَغَضِبَتْ فَاطِمَ بِنْتُ Muhammad. Allah Muhammad. فَهَجَرَتْ أَبَا She became angry. We're not talking about the anger of just some random person. The one who the Prophet describes as Sayyidat Nisa al Alameen. If it was true that the Prophet said, Nahnu ma'ashir al Anbiya la nuwarrith, would it make sense for her to be Sayyidat Nisa al Alameen and reject the hadith of the Prophet? If Abu Bakr was a truthful person, a mu'min is not going to be suspicious of another mu'min. But Fatima to Zahra became angry. And her anger is evidence that she rejected that hadith. The implication is what? This is a lie that you are attributing to the Prophet. She becomes angry and she doesn't speak to him for the rest of her life. فَلَمْ تَزَلْ مُهَاجِرَتَهُ حَتَّى تُوفِيَ She became angry at Abu Bakr. Now oftentimes when we speak about Fatimiyya, sometimes we try to prove the details of what transpired. My argument is that let's suppose, because there are some people who are so stubborn that believe me, even if there was video footage of the attack, they wouldn't accept it. But what is undeniable, what is undeniable is that Fatima to Zahra was angry at Abu Bakr and she refused to speak to him until the day that she died. And not only that, the narration says, فَلَمَّا تُوفِيَتْ And this narration is also in Bukhari. When she died, دَفَنَهَا زَوْجُهَا عَلِيُّ لَيْلًا She was angry at Abu Bakr. She did not speak to him until the day that she died. Does a mu'min hold a grudge against another mu'min like that? How is she Sayyidat Nisa al alameen But she holds this grudge for the rest of her life. Fatima to Zahra is not just a woman who's going to hold a grudge. She is the daughter of the Prophet. She is Sayyidat Nisa al alameen She's angry with him. She doesn't speak to him until the day that she dies. Ali ibn Abi Talib buries her at night. And the riwayah in Bukhari says, وَلَمْ يُؤْذِنْ بِهَا Abi Bakr." She did not even want them to attend her funeral. This is something that no one can deny. With other details, some people will say, oh, but the Senad, we're not sure if this is an authentic narration. Okay, leave all of that. We believe that's all true. But since we're dealing with stubborn people, let's stick to these facts. She was angry. She refused to speak to him until the day she died. She did not, she did not want him to participate in her funeral. This is enough of a calamity. Meaning, we have the famous narration where the Prophet ﷺ, and there are different versions of this hadith, where the Prophet, when he speaks about Fatima ﷺ, he says, Allah is pleased when Fatima is pleased. And Allah is angry when Fatima is angry. And this hadith, even a staunch critic of hadith, like a Dhabi, a Sunni hadith scholar, who has one of the most stringent criterions for authenticating the hadith, he says this hadith is sahih. It's correct. It's authentic. So, if this hadith is telling us, and the Prophet says, Fatima baba'atun minni man aghdabaha aghdabani, so Fatima is angry. Let's do some basic math here. 
right? Fatima is angry at Abu Bakr. The hadith tells us that the Prophet becomes angry when Fatima is angry. So what does that mean? Angering Fatima angers the Prophet. And we have other hadith where angering Fatima angers Allah. If you remember in the beginning of my lecture, what did I say? Some people want to treat this confrontation as a historical issue. It happened 14 centuries ago and let's move on. But I also began this majlis with a verse of the Quran and this is where the theological implication can be seen. Allah, what does he say in Surah Al-Mumtahin? 60, Surah 60, Ayah number 13. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amin, O you who believe, la tatawallaw qawman ghadiballahu alayhim. O you who believe, do not take as guardians, as awliya, as leaders, as friends, people whom Allah is angry with. And this is what it all boils down to. The Quran says, do not take as your wali, your guide, someone that you obey, someone that you love. Someone, people who have angered Allah. Angering Fatima is to anger Allah. So this incident has important theological implications. How can the one who has incurred the wrath of God be the Khalifa of the Muslims? How can you take your deen from someone who has incurred the wrath of Allah? Others may find, find justifications, but there is a verse in the Quran that says, Ya ladina amanu la tatawallaw qawman ghalib Allahu alayhim. Allah in Surah Al-Ahzab, Surah 33, verse 57, what does Allah say? Inna al Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa wa yusalluna ala ya ladina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. And the next verse, what does Allah say? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi Inna al yu'dhuna Allah wa rasoolahu. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ لَعَنَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ وَعَدَّ لَهُمْ عَذَابًا مُهِينًا This incident is about who we take our Islam from. It's about who our leaders are after the Prophet. The Quran says, do not take as awliya those who have angered Allah. We have clear evidence that Abu Bakr and Umar angered Fatima. That's not something that can be taken lightly. And another issue is, we also have another hadith, and it's, there are different versions of this hadith, that says, مَنْ مَاتَ وَلَمْ يَعْرِفْ إِمَامَ زَمَانِ مَا تَمِيتَةً جَاهِلِيَةً Whoever dies without knowing the Imam of their time, or whoever dies without having paid allegiance to the Khalifa of the time, they die a death of Jahiliyyah. Question, and this is a, no one can answer this question. We know for certain that Fatima to Zahra did not give bay'ah to Abu Bakr. We know that for certain. Would any Muslim today dare say that Fatima died because if you argue that Abu Bakr is the, the rightful Khalifa of the time, the conclusion is what? Fatima did not give him allegiance. She was angry at him. She died angry at him. She refused to allow him to attend her funeral. She did not give allegiance. The conclusion is what? That if that's going to be your argument, that means she died a death of jahiliyyah. And we know that she didn't because she is Sayyidat Nisa al Alameen. So, what is the only alternative? Maybe the rightful successor of the Prophet is not who you think it is. 
in these nights we only have a few minutes left. But I want to take all of you to that dark night when Amir al Mu'mineen, salawatullahi alayhi, buried the daughter of the Prophet. Imagine Amir al Mu'mineen, salawatullahi alayhi, carrying the body of the beloved daughter of the Prophet. Amir al Mu'mineen had just finished burying Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And now he is losing the most dear person to him. The Imam السلام, his heart is already bleeding over the loss of Rasulullah. And now he has to farewell the only person that he would confide in. The one who was his spiritual equal. The one who he used to seek refuge with the daughter of the Prophet. Whenever he would look at her, he would remember Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And this is where you see after Amir al-Mu'mineen buries Fatima alayhi salam at an undisclosed location. In the middle of the night, he goes to the grave of the Prophet and he complains. I want you to feel the pain of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam on this night. He addresses Rasulullah and he says, Assalamu alayka ya Rasulullah. Wa ala ibnatika nazilat bi jiwarik. Wa sari'at lihaqibik. Assalamu alayka ya Rasulullah. Peace and blessings be upon you ya Rasulullah. And upon your daughter who is now rejoining you, your daughter who has joined you shortly after your departure. Ya Rasulullah, qalla'am safiyyatika sabri. Ya Rasulullah, my patience has run thin. ورق عنها تجلدي يا رسول الله لقد استرجعت الوديعة وأديت الأمانة Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, Ya Rasulullah, the trust that you gave me on the day that I married Fatima, your trust is now returning to you. And then Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, Amma husni fasarma. Ya Rasulullah, my grief will never go away. My grief is forever. Wa amma layli fa I feel that my nights will be unending. Ila ayyakhtar Allahu li daraka allati anta bi I will remain like this in my perpetual grief, Ya Rasulullah, until I join you where you are in Alamul Akhirah. And then the Imam alayhi salam, he says, What was it to Nabi Ukabna to Kabitava for the Ummatika Allah? Ya Rasulullah, Fatima will tell you about what happened to her and how the Ummah they came against her after your departure. And then the Imam says, Fahfias Suan was Takhbir al Hal. Ya Rasulullah, ask her about what happened after you. How much pain is in her heart? Ya Rasulullah, there is so much pain in her heart, but she did not have anyone to share her grief with. The narrations say that when the house of Fatima alayhi salam was attacked, Salman al Farisi was not there. He comes and he asks Sulaim, What happened to the house of Fatima? Qala Sulaim, 
قلت يا سلمان هل دخلوا ولم يكست إذان سلمان asked did they really enter the house of Fatima without permission هل دخلوا ولم يكست إذان what does Sulaim say قال إي وعزة الجبار وما على الزهراء من خبار فمذ رأوها عصروها عصرا كادت بنفسي أن تموت حسرا تصيح أيا فضة أسل ديني فقد وربي أسقط جنيني لا حول ولا قوه الا بالله العلي العظيم وسيعلم الذين ظلموا ال محمد اي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبه للمتقين